Welcome to Debbie's Dream Foundation, Curing Stomach Cancer Presents, Survivor Sisters, a live interview with siblings who avoided CDH1 stomach cancer. Today's interview features Jessica Jackson Sasser and Nicole Jackson McDonald, aka the Jackson Sisters. The sisters will be discussing their family history with cancer, their discovery of their CDH1 gene mutation, and their decision to have their stomachs removed in 2016. They'll also share some of the challenges they face during recovery, their decision to raise awareness, and what it's like to live without a stomach. For the sake of time, we encourage all attendees to type any questions that you may have for the sisters into the chat box, and we will get to them towards the end. Just as a little housekeeping, I'm Brittany Starks, Communications Coordinator with Debbie Stream Foundation, Curing Stomach Cancer, and I'll be moderating today's interview. For those who aren't familiar with DDF, Debbie Stream Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to raising awareness about stomach cancer, advancing funding for research, and providing education and support internationally to patients, families, and caregivers. DDF seeks as its ultimate goal to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. For more information about Debbie Stream Foundation, please visit our website at www.debbiestream.org. Pictured here is Debbie Zellman, the founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation. Debbie was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer in April of 2008. She had no risk factors and only vague symptoms. At the time, she was told that her chance of being alive in five years was only 4%. She endured harsh chemo regimens and targeted treatments and experienced many reoccurrences over nine and a half years. Unfortunately, Debbie passed away on December 23rd, 2017 at the age of 50 after a nine and a half year battle with cancer. She dedicated herself to helping others with stomach cancer by raising awareness and providing resources and education. Debbie founded DDF in April of 2009 and as an organization, we continue her important work and legacy. In a few short years, DDF has achieved many great milestones. We have 33 chapters across the US, including in Canada and Germany. We host events across the US and in Canada. Our PrEP program helps hundreds of patients, families, and caregivers throughout the world, matching inquirers with stomach cancer survivors and caregivers using specific disease criteria. We host stomach cancer educational webinars and symposia year round, and our website contains in-depth information about stomach cancer, a lecture library, clinical trial information and matching service, stomach cancer support community, blogs, and resources. We also have provided $1 million in research grants to date. In addition to research funding, we also advocate at a national level. This year, our Capitol Hill Advocacy Day was a huge success. We hosted 115 advocates and had 230 meetings on the Hill, making this our largest and most successful turnout yet. Due to the efforts of the foundation, our partners and our dedicated advocates, we help secure continued funding for stomach cancer research. The peer-reviewed cancer research program received funding from Congress in the amount of $110 million, a $20 million increase from last year. Here you can see some of our upcoming events. To learn more, visit our website under the heading events. DDF is headquartered in Plantation, Florida. Our office hours are Monday through Friday. 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. And here you can see some of our important phone numbers and email addresses that you can use to contact our office and staff. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the Jackson sisters, Jessica and Nicole. Just a brief little bio about them. Jessica Jackson Sasser and Nicole Jackson McDonald, AKA the Jackson sisters, lost their mother in 1994 to breast cancer when she was only 38 years old. 
Cancer had always loomed over them as they had lost other family members to various forms of the disease as well. Their family history and the fact that their mother was so young at the time of her diagnosis allowed them to undergo genetic testing in 2016. They learned that they carried a rare mutation to the, their CDH1 gene. This meant that they had an 83% risk of developing hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, a form of stomach cancer that is rare, hard to detect, and comes with an incredibly low survival rate. These results would alter their lives in ways they could have never imagined. And right now I'm going to turn over the screen. Um, if you ladies can unmute your microphones, we'd love to hear from you. Hey. Hello. Thank you so much for hosting this. We're so excited. <laughs> We're excited to have you. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules. We know that you ladies are busy and moms and wives. So we definitely <laughs> appreciate you being here today to share your story. So um, we talked, I talked a little bit about your bio, but I want you to like, tell us a little bit more. Like your mom died at such a young age, 38 of breast mm -hmm. cancer. And your bio mentions how other family members die from other forms of cancer. Can you tell us like, how did this realization of your family history with cancer lead you both to getting genetic testing done? Yeah, um, and it actually, it really started even before um, we were tested in 2016. So when I was coming out of college, um, a doctor just kind of mentioned, oh, you had a mom, your, or your, your mom was um, diagnosed at a very young age, and all that, you kind of just, we just focused on the breast cancer side at that time, so he suggested testing me for BRCA, which of course came back negative, so kind of breathed that sigh of relief and thought we didn't really have any other risk factors, but he didn't really go through the rest of the family history with me at the time, and you know, we were kind of those people who didn't, it was kind of spotty what we knew. So we knew that our mom's grandmother had passed away of some form of intestinal or we, nobody, it's like in the 50s and 40s, you know, things just weren't diagnosed as well. So we just knew it was something GI related um, and that there had been some other issues on that side of the family. So our mom's father, even like was very cautious about what he would eat and would make the comment, you don't know how many people in this family were killed by their stomachs. So, but no, nobody ever connected that with our mom having breast cancer. And so I tested negative for BRCA, kind of moved on with life. And then I had my son um, in 2012. And not long after that, I ended up switching doctors. And in a conversation, I mentioned to her, you know, breast cancer is a concern, but I don't have BRCA, so I don't have any other genetic connections. And she was like, well, actually, there's, at the time, she said there were about 13 other known genetic risk factors tied to breast cancer as well as other cancers. So we kind of went through family history at that point, and she recommended that we go through a full panel and it kind of took some time to get everything lined up and approved. And ultimately, um, in January of 2016 is when I finally met with a geneticist and went through everything and had a full-blown panel done. And that's when we found out about the CDH1 mutation. Wow. And it kind of connected a lot of dots at that, at that point because we were like, well, that's what they talked about. This is this thing that loomed over the family that was you know, killing people, their stomachs. and that's when you were able to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. yes. Wow. Wow. So you two are really close uh, from what I could tell. <laughs> and so you found out around the same time that you had this. Talk about it. Talk about that for us. Actually, Jessica was tested first. And when she got her results, the geneticist called her and wanted her to come into the office and actually ask her to bring me in with her. And so we went to the geneticist together to talk about her results. And then I was tested that same day. Once we got her positive result, they wanted to go ahead and test me. So they went ahead and tested me that day. And it took about two weeks to get my results. Wow. So for those of who may not know, understand what CDH1 gene mutation is, can you ladies like talk a little bit about what you know about it? 
Yeah, so it was one of those genes. I think I, I didn't even realize I had a CDH1 gene until she um, made that connection and called me about it. And so my understanding is it's just it's a gene and it, pro, um, it codes like certain types of proteins. And in the case of our mutation, when it's left unchecked, it kind of causes rapid um, multiplication of certain tumors. I mean, it's not able to offer that suppression. And so, I mean, obviously, because a lot of times you just hear people say things in chat rooms and they'll say, oh, you have a CDH1 gene. Well, everyone has a CDH1 gene. Ours just happens to have a mutation somewhere along the line. I mean, there are various forms of mutation. Um, you know, some people have deletions, or in our case, I guess the best way to explain it is all genes are like a basically a long train of letters, and you have A, G, T, F, and and so basically in ours, at some point in the chain, instead of where an A is supposed to be, ours has swapped to a G, and so ours is just like a variant and. We didn't really understand, and you, you know, when the geneticist called and told me, you know, you have this mutation, I'd never heard of it before. I kind of made the comment, you know, we had talked about some advanced screenings that would be in place if, if I did carry any mutations. And I was like, well, do I qualify for advanced screenings? And she was like, yeah, but we need to talk about some other stuff, like based on where you are in life. And so, that's when you go to Google, which they don't want you to do, but of course you do. Um, and, and you find all this out. And I just kept hoping that I would go in and she would say, well, your mutation is different. You have a different variant. Yours isn't known to be pathogenic. Um, but unfortunately, when we met with her, went through it, ours was one that was known to be pathogenic. We even sent our reports to... Uh, a doctor in New Zealand, Perry Guilford, who's just kind of this, this is his gene. He discovered it. He's done all the work on it. And when he looked at my results, he was like, no, yours is one that is, is a known pathogenic mutation. Wow. Wow. So. It's amazing too, like how you're able to talk about it. Like you're the expert of your experience and you've learned so much. Thank you for explaining that. Cause I know a lot of people who may be new, who may be watching this at a later time, they also want to know that information. So what was going through your minds when you learned of the, your test results? Like what did, what were you thinking and feeling? Like that had to be scary. Oh my gosh, holy cow. It, I just remember for me, I found out on a Thursday at the beginning of March and it was two, three days before my son's fourth birthday. Mm -hmm. And we had, it was on, I found out on Thursday, we had his birthday party on Saturday. And I just remember even having to walk out of his party a couple of times and go into a corner and like hold back tears. Cause all you're thinking when you hear these numbers is I'm going to die. Like this is, this is going to get me. How many birthdays do I have with him? Do I already have this? And I just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it was very, very overwhelming just to have that feeling that there's something in your body or there's something wrong with your body that you can't control mm -hmm. and there's no way to know what it's doing wow and what about you I nicole wait a couple of weeks to get my results back and i i, I really did feel in my heart like like i had it like i, I already knew you that felt I, that you had it already i felt like i did yeah i felt like i did uh, and then we had a big family vacation planned actually with my sister and her family and we were in new york city and in central park and i got the phone call that i carried the mutation and i, I mean it it was a shock but i felt like i already knew that i had it so i felt like i was prepared like jessica helped me prepare for that was it something intuitive or did you have certain feelings in your body? Like, what was it that made no, you feel? No, I had, didn't have any symptoms or anything in my body. I just felt in my heart like I knew that I had it. And, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about it and prayed about it. And um, when I found out that day, I was, I was at peace with it. We had already talked about um, our options and that we were going to do this together if we both had it you know if it was just her I was going to be right there with her but if I had it too we were going to do this together wow so. that like so what was it I know I think I saw an interview where 
you ladies were talking about your doctor and just how gentle your doctor was with you all, kind and gentle with you all, um, just sharing the news, treating you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think we talk to a lot of patients often, especially when they're first diagnosed with gastric cancer. They'll call and they're, they usually have different stories, but the way that the doctor interacts with the patient makes a huge difference. So I just want yeah. you ladies to talk a little bit about that, um, your experience. Yeah, I, I feel like from a physician standpoint, we were incredibly blessed the entire journey um, from the geneticist who diagnosed me all the way to the surgery. Well, I mean, we had a, we, we both live in Alabama and we went out of state to Texas to have surgery done. Um, our physician there was just amazing and then here back in Alabama we have another physician who's followed us on the back end um, and he, he made the terrible mistake of giving us his cell phone number so he could follow <laughs> but did you text him in the middle of the night like hey I'm experiencing this <laughs> it was so funny like last year I had a little bit of a scare and had to go to the hospital and be observed overnight and while that was happening, we were actually having a party at our house. So we had a party going out of our house. We're at the hospital and he comes in to check on me and he was like, well, actually there's a bridal shower going on at my house right now and I don't want to be there. So I'm just going to hang out with you. <laughs> but that just, it really did make all the difference. Like even going back to being in the genetics off, genetics office the day she told us the news. I mean, it was horrible odds. You're talking about a horrible, undetectable cancer. You're talking about a very rare mutation. Um, she had told us at that point she had never had anyone actually test positive. She had learned about it in school. She had tested people for it, but had never had anyone come back positive. And she actually cried with us, like while she was telling us, like she was very invested um, in this. Wow. And then like moving into like looking for a surgeon, that was really important to us was finding somebody that we were comfortable with. Um, obviously, we wanted somebody who was going to do a great job. Um, but this is so there was so much unknown. I mean, not many people remove their stomachs prophylactically. So we wanted somebody who would answer those questions and answer it in a way that made us comfortable. And we met with three different surgeons. Um, and, and one of them, the first we met with, was not very open and warm. And like when I asked a question, the response would be, I just know. I just know. And I was wow. like, oh, no, I need you to tell me. Um, but then the other two were, were the ones who answered every question and and ultimately we made our choice just because one had done um, had done more prophylactic gastrectomies and the center the, the hospital they were at had done more um, but I just remember even being in there asking questions and having my notebook because I'm the note taker of us and he just took my notebook and started writing all the answers down to my questions and oh, that's like cool. on the back end being able to just call or email and talk and I had a major complication 10 months out of our surgery and our doctor here in Birmingham was the one who took care of everything at that point and like I just I don't know if I can say his name or not but um you <laughs> His name is Martin Heslin and he's at UAB here in Birmingham and just from that like moment on like you just have this connection and he's always there for any question his office contacts us when they have people not with CDH1 mutation but people who are about to go through a gastrectomy um, he runs his own foundation and has asked us to be like faces of gastric cancer for him um, so just forming that bond when you're going through something like that, I, I feel like it made it a lot easier for us. What about you, Nicole? Did you have anything to add to that? What was your... Yeah, I did, you know, like she said, we met with three surgeons. The first one, um, you know, he had a great reputation. He had done these surgeries. Uh, he, he had probably done as many as the one that we used in Texas but we just didn't have a great feeling. You know, we would ask questions like, well, how, how are you gonna know that you've removed 
all of the stomach. You know, how are you going to know that there's nothing left? And, you know, he would say, because I just know I've done this before, you know, and that just wasn't enough for us. You know, our doctor in Texas said, you know, well, this is how we're going to do this and we're going to send it to pathology and I'm going to wait on those pathology results to come back before we finish the surgery to make sure that I've gotten everything, you know, that's the kind of thing that we needed to hear. Mm -hmm. We needed to be reassured. And I'm sure the first guy knew exactly what he was doing, exactly mm -hmm. what he was talking about. But we needed to know, you know, mm -hmm. we needed to know for ourselves how he was going to ensure that. I totally can identify with that. I recently lost a loved one September 30th, and they had a similar experience, um, you know, initially. But um, speaking of, of that kind of experience, what, how important do you think it is for people to um, recognize when they're not feeling 100% comfortable with a doctor to seek out other doctors? Oh, it's a, a million percent important. Yes. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, there are other doctors out there. You know, Debbie's Dream, there are other cancer websites that have information about surgeons at centers of excellence that have the most experience. Most of these surgeons will be willing to do a phone conference with you or a video conference so you don't have to fly out there. Uh, you know, it doesn't hurt at all to get two, three, four opinions, as many as you need to feel comfortable. Yeah, you have to be your own advocate. I mean, I think doctors are wonderful people and they have a wonderful calling, but they're people. Um, and, and just like you don't always mesh and vibe with people at work or people at school or, you know, it, it's the same with that relationship. And when you're talking about something as, as intimate as, as cancer can be, I mean, you're talking, you know, surgeries and really harsh treatments and just this long ongoing process, you really want to have that relationship where you're comfortable discussing everything with that person and that you're comfortable with the responses and the feedback that they're giving you. So if you aren't comfortable, like you should always seek another opinion. Yes. And like yeah. Jessica said, you have to advocate for yourself. You know, the, the geneticist that originally told us about our mutation wanted to send us to a general surgeon and, you know, people would, would just do that. You know, some people wouldn't research and, and look into other doctors and centers of excellence. And you really have to be your own advocate and research, research, research. Thank you ladies for that. Um, I'm sure that will be really helpful um, input from you all for people to hear. Um, now to hear someone say they've had their stomach removed, it's may sound a little extreme to the average person <laughs> um, just because you don't understand the nature of it. Like, what is that going to be like, right? Um, take us back to how that even became an option or a topic of discussion. So Google informed us that that is what we would have to do. Um, like I said, when, when she called um, that day just to tell me that they had identified a mutation, she was like, don't Google it. And I did. Um, and that was, you read through and then it, it says recommendations and it's prophylactic total gastrectomy. And I was just like, are you joking? Like that's A, not humanly possible. Like what in the world am I going to have to walk around like feeding tubes and like how will I even live? Um, and then we went into her office and kind of like I was saying, I kept hoping to hear like, nope, that's not you. And I said, I, I know that the recommended treatment or course here is to do a prophylactic total gastrectomy. And she was like, mm -hmm, that's right. So, I mean, I can't even put into words like the shock that you feel. And my husband was the one who, I mean, I just remember him telling me that day, like, this is going to suck. This is going to be awful, but you get, I, need to, I need you to do this. Like, you have to do this. And then we started through the wonders of just the internet. Um, we started finding other people who had the mutation, who had already gone through surgery. We found blogs and had stalker tendencies and got email addresses and Facebook pages and, 
and just really started reaching out to people who had already walked this path. And that's when it really became clear to us, I think, that it was very doable. Um, you can have a very normal, healthy life after a gastrectomy. It's different, but there's it, it's perfectly wonderful. And, and I think that's even kind of why we do a lot of what we do is we know how much it helped us to have other people who, out there who had already gone through it. It, it kind of eased that shock and that scare factor. Wow. Yeah, so when you see other people out there with families and children and living normal lives, you know, it gives you that hope and that reassurance that you need that this could be okay. That's, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. How did you both, um, well, you kind of talked about how you both arrived at the decision, but I'm sure the obvious question for everyone would be, what is it like to live without a stomach? Um, for us, I would say it's actually, it's pretty normal. Um, the first little bit was hard and there's definitely an adjustment period that you go through, but we're four and a half, close to five years out now. And people who don't know the story would never have a clue. Um, I started a new job like two years ago. And that is not what I go into a situation and leave with like, hey, I'm Jessica, I don't have a stomach. Right. So you know, I worked there for quite a while, I worked there for several months and I actually ended up seeing um, someone that I worked with at a, an event for stomach cancer. And they were like, wait, like, what are you doing here? Why are you on the poster out there? <laughs> and kind of going through the story and it was just like, I never would have guessed. Um, eat smaller portions, like I'm not going to get a, you know, 18 ounce ribeye, but just eating smaller portions, kind of a little more steady throughout the day. And I think a lot of times people who don't know who kind of see my eating habits, just assume I'm one of those like healthy people who just does, eats the, you know, six small meals a day just for that reason. But, um, I think that's the overall thing I would really want to get out to somebody who has maybe just found out they have this mutation and they're looking at this and they're just like overwhelmed and freaked out is that for for us, life is actually very normal. We're very active. Um, I've never been a big exerciser, but I, you know, will get out and walk around the block every now and then. I jump on the trampoline with my son all the time. Like we're running and gunning. Nice. What about what about yeah. you, Nicole? Same. I mean, you know, I would want people to realize that the first, you know, the first six months to a year is hard. It's an adjustment. Your, you know, your body has to get used to this new digestive system. It, it's not going to be easy. But after that, it gets easier and easier. And like she said, four and a half, five years out from surgery now, we live completely normal lives. I mean, there's nothing that I want to do that I can't do. You know, I work full time. My kids are active in sports. I'm running with them. You know, I'm going to every sporting event. Um, you know, we're able to do everything we want to do. There's, you know, it doesn't limit us in any way. You mentioned how part of the recovery is like pretty hard. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what that process has been like? Sure, and it's different for everyone. You know, mm -hmm. some of the obstacles that I faced in the beginning were different than the obstacles that Jessica faced in the beginning, which was great though, because we had each other and we called each other every day. You know, I've got this going on. What, you know, what's going on with you? And, you know, but, you know, in the beginning, it was a lot of, um, I had a lot of fatigue, just a whole lot of nausea. You know, I thought, is this ever gonna end? You know, I've done this surgery to save my life, but I don't want to live like this the rest of my life. You know, you start to get discouraged, but mm -hmm. it does get better and that all goes away. And, you know, you, you get used to this new normal, but, you know, I had a lot of nausea in the beginning, a lot of malabsorption where I didn't get a lot of the nutrients that I needed. As soon as I would eat, I would get sick and have to run to the bathroom. Um, you know, so it took a while for my body, even, 
I mean, there were some medicines that they gave me to help me and that helped a lot, but even just giving your body time to figure it out, you know, your body's in shock after something like that mm -hmm. and it has to get used to the new way of running things. And it does, it, it, your body is marvelous. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, and I'm going to get back to you, Jessica, as well. You, you mentioned that, um, you know, you had moments of being discouraged. You know, what, how did you get through those moments of, of being discouraged? What was it that carried you through those moments? Our kids. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things for me was knowing that I had the mutation and knowing that they have a 50% chance of having this mutation. The thing that kept me going and kept me strong was I want them to be able to look at, at me and say, if I have to do that one day, it's going to be okay. My mom did it and she's fine. I'll be okay. So my biggest strength was my children. And Jessica, for you, what was your recovery process and what got you through those moments? So like Nicole said, it was a different process for each of us and we had different things. Um, early on, my biggest issues um, coming right out of surgery were stricture, which is where, where they joined the esophagus and the intestine, it would tighten up and food could not go through. So I'd have to go through a series of um, stretches. So they would go in and do an endoscopy and use a balloon to stretch open the area so food could start passing through. Um, I had a lot of issues with bile reflux. So without the stomach, this is something we'll talk about later. You don't have acid, so you don't have acid reflux anymore, no matter what people say. Um, but bile would just, come, and, and your body's learning, your pancreas is having to take over and do things it's never done before. So, you know, it was producing excess bile and it would just come up like into your throat at just random times and make it really hard to eat. Um, another issue that I had came, like I said, it came about 10 months after surgery. So we had had feeding tubes that we actually, I think we did what, two feedings through them? And then we were like, nope, not doing this. Um, but where it had come out, there was obviously scar tissue left behind in my abdomen. And there's a little bit more free space um, without the stomach. So things kind of move and shift a little more inside. And so my... Um, my SMV, the main like blood supply coming off your heart, feeding your intestines, my SMV got caught in that scar tissue and it cut off blood flow. And I ended up um, in the middle of the night, emergency surgery. Um, I went septic. Um, so I went through a very hard, I went through, um, it was an emergency open surgery. Um, I was left um, open and on a ventilator for several days in ICU waiting to see if everything would return like it was supposed to. And then I had another surgery after that to kind of recheck everything and close me up. And at that point, it was kind of like recovery started all over again. Um, and I started experiencing some of the other issues like Nicole talked about at that point. I had severe malabsorption and had to go on enzymes. Um, fatigue. I had severe weight loss. I dropped down to about 97 pounds. Um, and you can't tell from me sitting right now, but I'm 5'9". I'm a very tall girl. So that was not a good size for me. And I had a lot of issues that stem from um, being underweight and, and malnourished. Um, but luckily, just kind of it, it, over time, it was just like my body caught up to what it was supposed to be doing. And just echoing what Nicole said, I mean, my, my husband and my son were what kept me going. Um, like, I, I only have one. I have a little boy named Andy. And I just remember, like, I remember how much it, it's, like, how awful it was growing up and not having my mom there for things. And so I just had to keep reminding myself that I did this so that Andy would have his mom at graduation and Andy would have his mom at his wedding. And then like Nicole said too, I, I mean, I know that there's a very good chance that my son is going to have to go through something similar, if not exactly the same. And I want him to be able to look back, like Nicole said, and say, my mom did it. Wow. Speaking of your, your children, um, how do you feel about having your children tested for, you know, genetically tested, um, given that, you know, it is a something that runs in the family or has run in the family? 
Yeah. Um, of course, we think it's very important. We would love for them to be tested as soon as they are able to be tested. Uh, my oldest is about to be 15 and he can be tested at 18 and he wants to be tested as soon as he can. Wow. Well, that's a decision at that point, you know, when they mm -hmm. turn 18, it's going to be their decision. We can't make them test because we have family members right now that we would love to go be tested that don't want to be tested. We have family members right now that know they carry the mutation but won't have the surgery. And, you know, that that's hard. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't control that. Right. What about you, Jessica? Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, I definitely want Andy to be tested when he is he's old enough to make the decisions and to understand. We had a little bit of a back and forth. Um, my son has juvenile arthritis mm -hmm. and um, there, he, he took methotrexate for a long time and had some issues with like his elevated liver enzymes from that. So they wanted to move him over to a different medication. Um, but some of those medications come with a high risk or a higher risk of certain types of cancer. So they had talked about testing him early and we really did not want to do that if we didn't have to, just for the fact that at, he was six, I think at the time that was discussed, there's nothing you can do about it at six. You just have to, and I, I just knew the stress that it would cause us every time he said, my stomach hurts, you know? Um, but I definitely, as he gets older, and Nicole said this too, she has another son and, and our boys are a year apart. They're starting to connect dots and they're starting to realize, and Andy has made comments like, well, you had cancer and your mom had cancer and Aunt Nicole had cancer. So does everybody in our family just have cancer? So I think as they get older too and, and kind of start connecting those dots and realizing They'll, uh, they'll want to do it too. At least that's my hope. I would want him to, to want to know and, and be proactive. Definitely. Um, is there a special diet that you ladies follow? Um, you know, people would probably want to know that as well. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we should. But eat no. everything in sight? No. <laughs> eat whatever I mean my my version of diet is I eat whatever I want I just try to manage the portion size what about you what about no, you Nicole <laughs> same I try to um try to not eat much fried foods or really really fatty foods not because I don't want to but because usually that's what tends to give me any issues if I do get sick which I rarely get sick anymore mostly because we do know now how to eat and how to manage it. And we, we know what, what we can and can't have. So um, we should probably eat more like someone that um, has had like gastric surgery, you know, healthier foods, not, nothing fried, um, limit your sweets, that sort of thing. But right now, I mean, we're just, we just eat whatever, whatever we want and thankfully we're at a point now where it works so we can <laughs> that's awesome to not have to be limited to what you might like so thank you for sharing that um you also have a blog called stomachless sisters that you started to document your journey and help raise awareness um during the month of november specifically am i right um mm -hmm. and then also stomach cancer awareness month is also the month of, of november and uh, just for those who may not know, DDF also has an initiative called Curing Stomach Cancer Month, where we have uh, individuals advocate and have their state declared um, Curing Stomach Cancer Month during the month. And to learn about that, you can visit our website, little shameless plug. <laughs> um, but why is sharing your story and advocating so crucial for you both? For one, one thing is for our children. We want them to have, um, other options, better options, better screening, um, things, you know, options that we didn't have. We want there to be more funding for research and, you know, not just for our children, but for other people. You know, when we started, that was our main goal was we've got to figure out something for our boys. We don't want our boys to have to go through this. We want to make it as easy on them as possible. But, you know, now what, since we've been out there and we've met people and we've been at these events, 
you've made so many connections and we have our own little stomachless family now with people all over the world and you just see how much of a need there is out there for better screening and better options and you know that's our our biggest focus right now is funding jessica <laughs> yeah and and I think too, one reason we, we wanted to do it is, like I said earlier, you know, when we found out that we carried this mutation, when we found out we were going to have to live a stomachless life, we were a little lost until we found other people who had gone through it. And that's, I mean, that's one thing I really want to do is if anyone ever is facing this, like I want them to reach out to us. I want to be a resource. I want to encourage and help them understand, you know, what this, what life is like after this. And, and then going back to two, like our boys, like she said, is, you know, the more you talk about these things and the more we put it out there and the more we advocate and I love your shameless plug because I'm trying to get Alabama to declare this <laughs> during the cancer month, so fingers crossed. Um, but the more you do that, um, I think the more people start to look at it and the more, like we said, research will start to kind of come along that way. And I would really hope that in 10 years or in 20 years when somebody finds out they have a CDH1 mutation, that prophylactic gastrectomy is not the first course of action, you know? And, and that's the importance of sharing your story and that's the importance of putting it out there and being an advocate, I think. Uh, that's, that's awesome, actually. And, you know, with everything that you both have been through, you know, are there any regrets for the decisions that you made to have your stomach removed? Like, not a single regret. Never, never one day did I have a regret. Even looking back at, you know, knowing that I went through, you know, complications or, or things like that, I still would do it all over again. Um, because I think we left this part out is after our surgery, um, they did pathology on our stomachs and we both had stage one cancer. It had not been detected. Um, we had gone through um, biopsies a month before we had had over 50 biopsies taken of our stomach and everything came back clear, but sure enough, there was cancer. Mm -hmm. So if we hadn't done it, we would have faced a much harder road. Did you have anything else to add, Nicole? No, um, that, you know, that's exactly what I said. You know, once we found out when pathology came back and we both had stage one cancer, there was no question that we had made the right decision and we couldn't have made another decision, you know, we couldn't have made a, another decision that would have, you know, we already had cancer. So right. we would have had a much bigger fight on our hands or we wouldn't be here. What advice would you give to others who may have similar family history with cancer and maybe never considered genetic testing? Yeah. Yeah. Go get yes, go so talk to your primary care doctor, outline your history, push for that test. They're readily available now. It's much easier to get genetic testing done than it was, you know, even, even when we got tested. Um, you know, there were still some hoops you had to jump through that, that they're kind of dissipating now. So if there's, a, if there's a question, if there's a doubt, like you get that test. Thank you. Um, Someone asked, what is the best way to communicate with others like you who may have CDH1 gene mutation? How did you find resources uh, of others who you could connect with? So there's actually a Facebook page for CDH1 um, mutation gene. Hold on, I'll even pull up the exact name of it for you. Um, so that's one way. I know on, um, can I say no? Stomach for cancer. <laughs> I know on their website they listed out blogs um, of people, so we went and like looked for blogs. Just even googling like CDH1 mutation blog, um, mm -hmm. and it'll pull up a list of people who have kept up blogs, and you can go on there. I know like on our blog there's a contact, and you can reach out to us through there. Um, on Facebook, it is CDH1 mutation gene. 
Um, it's just the name of the, of the group. Um, and there are a ton of people in there and there's always like chat going back and forth and questions. And I know for, for me, if, if like you were on that group and if you see us, just shoot us a message through the messenger and we'll respond. That was actually going to be my next question. How do people best reach out to you? But you said through your blog and through that Facebook group um, mm -hmm. is the best way. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that as well. And I think that may conclude uh, what we have today. Is there anything else that you want viewers to know? People who are watching, um, not live, but who will be watching this, what would you want them to know about your journey or any final remarks? Yeah. I think um, I would just want them to know, um, you know, going back to the question about if you have a history and getting genetic tested, um, I would just want people to know that you have so many options out there, but if you don't know, there, you can't access those options. Um, so the best thing you can do is to, to learn your risk factors, you know, on that, be an advocate for yourself. Um, you know, keep your medical history, be the one to go in there and say, you know, this is what's going on with me. This is my family history. Um, just really stand up and speak up for yourself. Um, and that's how you're going to kind of make it through. I would say the same thing. You're really going to have to, if you've been diagnosed with this mutation or with stomach cancer, or you're thinking that you could possibly have this mutation, just the importance of going out and having genetic genetic testing done and then being an advocate for yourself and researching and making connections and finding the best doctors and hospitals to get the best care you can and that you know you can have a normal healthy happy life it's not you know just because you have this that's not the end and living with a doubt of stomach is possible <laughs> absolutely very awesome. happy healthy normal life without a stomach I mean, I'm waiting on a cheeseburger to be delivered right now, so. Dinner time, right? Yes. I'm right there with you. <laughs> I thank you ladies so, so much for showing up to this evening to do this interview. This information is going to be so helpful to the people that can watch it and share it. We're going to share this on social media and through our platforms. And I can't thank you enough. Um, we're also going to have it on our website um, in our lecture library. So it will be able to be seen and replayed. Um, I know it's going to help so many people. So thank you thank so you much. Thank you for asking us. We're so honored that we got to do this. Well, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure and our honor. So thank you so much. And I hope you ladies enjoy the rest of your evening with your families. Eat your cheeseburger. <laughs> and, and please do get, get better, um, Nicole. I will. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to